Okay, so as you know, the rotator cuff relies upon concavity compression. That is the primary function of the rotator cuff is to keep the humeral head in the socket. And when we have unbalanced force couples or disruption of the rotator cuff, we lose that effect. The humeral head is going to rise superiorly as the deltoid pulls the humeral head out of the socket. So if we have this situation where we have adaptive changes such as this x-ray, where you have femoralization of the humeral head and you have superior migration, the only way we're going to treat this is by addressing stability and currently our way to do that is with a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. How does that work? It works by medializing the center of rotation and lengthening the arm. So our indications are basically those that come with uh, instability of the uh, humeral head relative to the glenoid. This is primarily rotator cuff arthropathy, which is basically 80%, I think, of the indications. You also have cases of failed rotator cuff repair, particularly with advanced atrophy or anterior superior escape. You have proximal humerus fractures, acute and three-part fractures, three- and four-part fractures, or malunions, revision arthroplasty, B2 glenoids, and then Another one that you know, I've seen emerging is massive cuff tears with instability, and I'll, t I'll, I'll talk specifically what I mean by that. Your requirements are that you have intact deltoid and axillary nerve function. The amount of which deltoid function you have is debatable, as you could refer to in this article. You need adequate bone stocks. If you have a case like this where you have grade four AVN of the humeral head and the glenoid, this is gonna be very difficult to implant a glenosphere, at least in, in my hands, having tried that case. And you need to understand the age and activity requirements of a reverse replacement. So again, your primary uh, indication is rotator cuff arthropathy, where you have both superior migration with a massive cuff tear and adaptive changes of the humeral head. I would not advocate having a reverse replacement for somebody without adaptive changes who simply has a massive rotator cuff tear. So this is your classic patient, again, femoralization, they got advanced atrophy. And in this setting where we previously did not have a solution, we, it's now been well shown that at least with a uh, standard Grammont prosthesis that we can get substantial improvements in elevation, as you can see here, on average from about 60 to 120 degrees. Failed cuff repair, here's a case that came to me with a previous rotator cuff repair and arthritis. So the only way I think you can address both of those uh, in this setting is somebody who has atrophy and arthritis is with a reverse shoulder replacement, as you can see here. Proximal humerus fractures that cannot be fixed. You have the option of hemiarthroplasty, which has been the standard for years. The problem, however, is the tuberosities don't heal very well, as you can see here. And in these, these cases, particularly patients over the age of 70 who have three and four part fractures, I've been moving more and more to reverse shoulder replacement. Ironically, the tuberosities actually heal better in these cases. I think it's probably due to the medialization, that is, it puts less tension on the greater tuberosity and the lesser tuberosity. And we've sh been shown that the outcomes are better in these cases. This is from the New Zealand Joint Registry. And they found that at five years, the results were superior for reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and there was no difference in revision, very important. Another study out of uh, Dartmouth where they reviewed re hemiarthroplasties and reverses. 3.6 year follow-up, and they found that the ASCS scores and forward flexion were higher in the reverse group, and again, importantly, no difference in complication. So I think currently, if you have an older patient who needs an arthroplasty, that is, you have a fracture you cannot fix, I think the standard now is reverse shoulder arthroplasty, and I think it's a great place to start if you don't do a lot of reverse replacement. Revision arthroplasty, this is something I run into quite a bit. When you have a uh, failed total shoulder, you have a high rate of glenoid loosening, and the majority of these patients have subscap deficiency. So again, you have an instability problem, you also have a bony problem, and I think that's most adequately addressed with a reverse. As you can see here, they had substantial improvements. We talked about the B2 glenoid already, so I'll go through this part quickly. But just to review how you measure that, you can measure the posterior humeral head subluxation by drawing the Friedman line, that is a line from the tip of the scapula to the center of the glenoid, and you want to look at the percentage of the humeral head that is posterior to that line. If that's greater than 80%, you have a high risk of failure. And when you look at the version, you want to look at the neoglenoid retroversion. So you draw that same Friedman line down the tip of the scapula center of the glenoid. You draw a line perpendicular to that to create your 90. And you can measure version at one of three points. You can go at the old glenoid. You can go at the intermediate glenoid, which would be from the front to the back. Or you can go to the knee, new glenoid, the neoglenoid. And the neoglenoid is the measurement that Jill used in his study. So that's the 27 degree uh, number. And he found when he used reverse shoulder replacement for these patients at five-year follow-up, he had no loosening or posterior instability. 
compared to his patients before where he had a high rate of that. So if I have an older patient, particularly with a B2 gleno with significant deformity, even if they have an intact rotator cuff, I currently do a reverse shoulder arthroplasty. Another indication I've seen to run into recently is older patients, that is these older ladies who have uh, essentially atraumatic instability and they've been out for you know, say a couple of months. So this is a, a lady who came to me recently. She was 75 years old. She's got rheumatoid arthritis and she's got chronic instability. And in, this hand, in, my, in my hands, even though she has intact tuberosities, she's got very poor quality tissue and chronic instability. The only way I think I'm gonna maintain that joint stable is with a reverse shoulder replacement as we did for her. So overall, your results, your, your results vary according to the etiology. You can see that forward flexion improvement's gonna vary between your diagnosis. Your best improvements are gonna be with rotator cuff arthropathy. You still are gonna get some improvements with post-traumatic arthritis or with revision. But when you look at external rotation and internal rotation, you have very little improvement with a classic Grammont prosthesis. So here's your typical patient where they get improvement forward flexion, but they lack external rotation and they lack internal rotation behind the back. That is with a classic Grammont prosthesis, which is a 155 degree cut and medialized center of rotation. Survivorship is about 95% at 10 years for rotator cuff arthropathy. It's less for other diagnosis, so you need to take that into consideration when you're implanting these in your patients. So I do still think that the majority of cases we should aim to place this in patients over the age of 70. It doesn't mean you can do that in every case. I've had patients much younger that I placed to reverse in, but in, your goal should be to avoid it for younger patients, in my opinion. When you look at functional outcome, however, that does appear to taper off about, after about six years. If you base it on constant scores, it's 88% at six years, but the constant score tends to drop after that. So how do we improve upon this? Well, I think the main culprit, at least currently, is scapular notching. When you look at the classical Grammont prosthesis, the rate of scapular notching is extremely high, 50 to 96%. And initially, the French tried to say that this was not a problem. They said that there was no correlation with the constant scores, although they did note, did note decreased strength and decreased elevation when you have notching. But I don't know how you can look at this increase in notching over time and this decrease in function and say these aren't related. If you have all of your patients notching, how are you going to find a difference? At the same time, there are other people who have found that notching makes a difference. Gerber, for instance, showed us that he had 56% rate of notching overall with a Grammont prosthesis, but the constant score was higher in those that did not, 86% in those without, it should say, and 66 in those with notching. So as Alex has liked to tell me, the Grammont is dead. How do you avoid that? Well, you need to look at your design. The biggest way that you're going to improve, uh, you can improve range of motion through several factors, but the biggest thing you need to avoid for notching is your adduction deficit. That is how much you're going to be prevented from adducting your arm at your side. And as you can see from this slide here, the biggest factor is your neck shaft angle. You can also offset the glenoid. You need to tilt the glenoid inferiorly, and you can increase your glenoid diameter. So as you can see in this image here, when you have a flat uh, cut, that is in this 150 degree cut, compared to a 130 degree cut, you're gonna have a lower adduction deficit. You can lateralize the glenosphere, as you can see in this schematic here. Clearly, if you take the glenosphere away from the scapula by lateralizing it, you're gonna have less tendency for impingement. You can also place that uh, in, yeah, as you can see, basically the same thing here. The consequence of this, however, is that you're going to have increased rotational forces upon the base plate of the glenoid because you're moving the center of rotation more laterally. And in Frankel's early design, he had failure rate of 10% with this at two-year follow-up, even though he had no notching. The problem, though, is that he was using 3.5 millimeter screws for his glenosphere, so when he went back into the lab and moved from 3.5 millimeter screws to five millimeter captured screw or locking screws, he improved the biomechanics of this substantially, that is that it, so that it could equal the other designs out there. And when he came back and looked at his results at five years and 76 patients, he had 94% survival, low rates of notching, 9%, and no base plate failures. More interestingly, he improved external rotation in his patients, as you can see here. 
One of the things about the Encore design, though, is it uses a four-screw design, so the anterior screw, if you look in the lab, it touches the, the subscap in all cases, and the posterior screw has a high tendency to uh, impinge upon the suprascapular nerve. It turns out that you really only need two screws. This is, looks at a two-screw uh, biomechanical study with a central post, which is inferior to a compression screw, as used in this, de in this uh, Arthrex design. And in this uh, biomechanical study, they found no difference particularly if you get divergence on your screws, that is spread, you're gonna have a better uh, stabilization of your base plate. Now, of course, you also can use an eccentric design. I think this is gonna be some, become something of the past, but an eccentric glenosphere can be, you can move it inferiorly so that you can uh, take the glenosphere away from the scapula, and this is particularly used with a 155 degree cut. And this doesn't reduce notching overall, but it does reduce the severity of notching, at least in this study that we did. One of the consequences, though, is that when you do an eccentric design, it may put some uh, abnormal forces upon the glenosphere that you need to take into consideration, particularly if you're inferiorly tilting it, which we're often aiming for. So when you put it together, there are a lot of factors you need to consider. This is just an example of uh, where I started. I used to use 155 uh, design with a bio-RSA that is using a bone graft, and currently I use a 135 degree component with a uh, plus four millimeter offset. And you can see when you look at these, even though you're getting offset here with 155 degree stem, you're already getting notch. And in this case, you can just see radiographically looking at it, there's no way this is going to notch. So I think what you want is adaptability so that you can match your patient's anatomy. And this is what, you know, I really like about this current prosthesis. So you have two inclination angles. My bias is clear to, clearly to the 135, but you can use 155 degrees if you so choose. There's a press fit geometry so that you can basically place your component quickly and easily without cementing it into place. Variable sizes, of course, to match your uh, needs. And there are three glenosphere sizes, 42, 39, and 36, sorry, metaphyseal sizes, with variability and offset. And you run into that uh, more than you would think. And the nice thing is that with having those different sizes, we can place three different sizes of glenospheres. Most of the designs out there only use a 36 or a 42, and this there's a 39 option as well. Of course, there's standard spacer options and uh, constrained liner options. Your base plate is press fit and has three sizes, small, medium, and large to accommodate different uh, anatomy. There's a central compression screw, which I think is really nice, and variable angle peripheral locking screws. And again, all you need is the two peripheral locking screws. So you can see again the different glenosphere option sizes. I typically place a 36 in a female and a, and a 39 in a man. I think 42 is also uh, nice, but it's just, it's a little bit harder to place the 42 millimeter glenosphere, particularly if you're using that lateral offset uh, like I use. So your setup and approach is the same as you basically do for your uh, anatomic shoulder arthroplasty when you use delta pectoral approach. You can use a freehand cut or an extra medullary guide. I like to use a freehand cut just because it's quicker for me. I'm then going to go to the glen, I'm basically going to protect the humeral head and go to the glenosphere where we're going to use a different, a small, medium, lar small, medium, or large guide. There's a guide pin that goes down that measures your central screw length, which is 15, 20, or 25 millimeters. We then have a two-step reaming process where you uh, prepare the glenoid to accept the base plate, as you can see here. And this creates an inlay, so there's excellent, excellent uh, initial stability, and then you can place your screws moving from inferior to central to superior. And again, I like to put the inferior screw almost all the way down, but not quite lock it into place so I can get that compression from the central screw. And then I'll go back and lock my inferior screw and then place my superior screw. I like to aim the superior screw anterior and superior so it hits the base of the coracoid. And therefore, I'm going to put my inferior screw sl inferior and slightly posterior. So I'm divergent not only in the coronal plane, but also in, in the sagittal plane. We're going to ream overward or over the top of the glenosphere to prepare for the, uh, or the top of the base plate to accommodate the glenosphere so there's no impingement. 
The base plate, as you can see here, one of the things I like about it, it's more anatomic. It has a greater surface area compared to the other designs out there. You can see even with the small Arthrex base plate, you have a greater surface area compared to the uh, standard Tournier de Pew design. So do you want the yolk or do you want the whole egg? Then you go back and prepare the humeral side where you're gonna basically broach up and we're gonna love it first bite principle. And then you use the peg for either the 135 or the 155 degree prosthesis. I again like to use 135. There's an offset to accommodate that anatomy that we talked about earlier. And I would say it's quite often that you end up using that, which is nice because I don't think you want to ream out the anterior cortex when you're preparing the metaphysis, particularly if you believe in repairing the subscapularis, which I do. You then you can place your trial components. I typically just place my glenosphere first and then go to my uh, humeral side and trial off of that. There's different tray sizes. If you need to use a spacer, I say in most cases you just need a three or six millimeter polyethylene, but occasionally if you need a spacer, you just want to be careful to uh, only use the three millimeter polyethylene with the, with the trays. And as you can see here, this is just impacting a uh, uh, spacer in this case with the polyethylene. So suggestions, I think you should consider using four millimeter lateral offset glenosphere with 135 degree design. I really think that's gonna decrease your rate of notching. If you are somebody who feels like you wanna use 155, this is a great way to sort of get used to the idea because you can try the 155 and then you can then intraoperatively dial to 135 and see what it's like. If you're gonna do that, you wanna use a standard polyethylene that is a knot constrained because you're already close to the, knot, to the scapula and you wanna consider inferior offset or eccentric options. I would also consider this in somebody who puts a lot of weight on their arms, that is somebody who's wheelchair bound because they're gonna have less deforming forces on their base plate. So your final radiographs, you wanna have them look like this. And thanks for your time.